Today's amazing guest is Graeme Blackwood. Graeme is the head of design at Argent. Let me tell you this, Argent is one of the best wallets you can have for buying and storing your precious cryptocurrency. I personally use it. It's one of the best out there. That's all I'm going to say, uh, but do check it out. Um, but Graeme is not only the head of design at Argent, but he is in a truest sense, a multidisciplinary designer. Yes, not only does he like to design for digital things, but he also loves design of analog things like clocks, hats. Oh, and he's an amazing drummer. So without further ado, Graham, welcome to the show, my friend. That's uh, quite an intro. Thank you, Janiel. Great to be here. Yeah, uh, my brother is a drummer. Um, he used to drum a lot, but uh, I think his current apartment doesn't, the policy there doesn't let you have a drum and just keep blasting it off. No, so, no, if, not if you've got a full acoustic kit, I think your neighbors <laughs> in an apartment block are going to probably break down your door and try, try and hurt you very much. So. <laughs> And, he, yeah. and he, he, he did say there was like a digital version of the drums where you kind of wear your headphones and so you can't hear it, but you got to put in the headphones and you just like, just play the drums, but you, you can't can. hear the... It's not this, it doesn't feel the same, obviously, but... That's exactly what he said. And so I'm kind of curious about your journey. Um, when did you realize that design is for, for you? Like, when did you realize that, hey, growing up as a kid, as a child, maybe later on in your life... When did you come to the realization that design is my calling? Yeah, it's a really tough one, really. I mean, I I have to go back, I think, to my parents. My mum is, um, she's an architect and she also sculpts. I think a couple of, well, that's not that one, but there's some sculpture in the background, actually, of hers. Um, and she always kind of instilled this creative stuff. She was always doing creative stuff with us. Um, and always encouraging it. She's also a musician and stuff. And I think that's where all my mu musical interests come from as well. Um, my dad is an engineer. He's a, he's an aeronautical engineer. Um, but he, so he designs flight simulators for pilot training, but he does the software side of it. So he always had computers. I mean, he, I think he, he's had computers since the seventies. So I was, I was born into a household which had computers from, from birth, really from a very young age. And I was always kind of, exposed both to this engineering kind of computer science side from my dad and then this kind of creative side from my mum. And I used to spend a lot of time gaming. You know, I remember playing Texas Instruments games, like, you know, I think it was Maze or Amazing or something like that. It was like a cat and mouse game and stuff. Um, right the way through to kind of Commodores and Amigas and all that sort of stuff. And so I was always gaming a lot. I think I wrote my first like basic program Hello World when I was eight years old on a Commodore 64, I think. Um, but so all, all the while in parallel were these kind of two tracks, engineering, kind of coding, science, gaming, and also this creative stuff. I would draw a lot, I'd paint, you know, all these sorts of things. Um, and my assumption was that I would that I would go into some kind of computer thing because I've spent a lot of time on, on the computer. Um, and around the age of 13, I... I built my first website. Again, it was for a game. And I think that was back in 98 or something. And then because very few people had websites around then, I started getting interest from kind of friends who ran companies or family friends and stuff. And gradually, like biz business colleagues of theirs started to, you know, I started to end up doing websites for these people and freelancing and stuff. Um, but it was all kind of code. Well, I mean, there's, there's a degree of creativity you have to do when you're creating a website fully yourself. Um, but really I, I'd assumed that I was going into full, in, into sort of a full code base, sort of, you know, much more into the hardcore of, and the depths of becoming an engineer and a developer and stuff. And I went to Canada in 2001 and met someone out there, um, a lady called Jackie, and she is a sculptor and an artist and a I think she did a lot of film set design. Jackie Bagley, her name is. And um, I just kind of, it was uh, in that, at that point, that something kind of sparked off in me that I just thought, hang on a second, I don't just want to be doing code. I, I want to do this creative stuff. This is, this is actually kind of who I am. Um, I, realize, I realize now that actually it was both, but, but we can get to that. And, and it was at that point, so I was probably around... I, I just sort of kind of guess I'm not going to do the work out, but about 15, 16, something like that. 
And then I came back and I thought, okay, I need, I now need to kind of shift away from this kind of computer science and start doing graphic design and fully understand, you know, learn all the kind of software and all the tools and stuff. So that's where I pivoted into graphic design. And then eventually I came full circle back into engineering. I was also, <laughs> yeah, I was also in Canada from 2000 to 2002. Um, okay. It, so I was in India before, then I moved there for two years. And yes. uh, we're in Canada, by the way. I was in Toronto. I was, I was, in, I was in Calgary. Oh, nice. It nice. was only for like a six, eight, six, eight week period over the summer, but it was, uh, it was a really, really kind of good time. Yeah. That is amazing. Went to the Stampede and everything. It was good fun. In Canada, I'll tell you this. Yeah. I love the place. But the weather, like coming from India, man, I love the warm weather. And um, let's just say that the cold in Toronto, oh my God, it, it got crazy. Yes. Yeah. Yeah. I've not experienced that. I was in the summer. So. <laughs> Lucky you. So yeah. you're doing graphic design. You're doing a lot of this design work, you know, how on earth does one end up from the graphic design realm to being a designer in crypto? Like, like what made you join Argent? Yeah, so I've always been attracted to, I think because of that engineering side and you know that computer science, I've always been attracted to kind of pretty interesting problems and and purposeful stuff as well. But it, that said, originally I just wanted to kind of work for companies where the clients were household names. So that was my after I got out of university, I did three years of a design degree, and I got out of university. And I was just looking initially, actually, I was look, I was hoping that my band was going to get signed and we were going to go on tour and tour the States and stuff. But uh, eventually I just thought, you know, what, well, I'm not going to hang around waiting for this to happen and I should actually get a job. So I got a job working in a, in a kind of a code shop. It was um, a little company that uh, built websites and, and apps for people, web apps and stuff. And um, gradually found my way through to getting kind of, more household name clients and then eventually um i uh, i moved to moscow for i was intending to move there for quite a long time but for all sorts of reasons we came back early um and then after i got back to the uk i found myself working for the UK, the uk government in um in the tax office in fact and it's, so it's like the irs it's called hmrc her majesty's revenue and customs very very fancy name, but it's like the IRS in the States. And um, I was designing, I was on a team that was designing the fraud detection system, a cyber fraud detection system. It was transaction monitoring. We were monitoring every transaction that flowed through um, every tax submission, every every benefit claim that flowed through HMRC. We, we monitored, basically. Um, and we looked for any kind of anomalies and we ran machine learning on it and stuff. And we're trying to catch anyone who was trying to defraud the taxpayer or defraud the government. So this was all the work for the Russian government. Were you in Russia? No, 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 this isn't Russia. This is back in the UK. No, 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 oh, not okay, Russian okay. government. Okay. <laughs> we might, might want to clarify that. that can clarify that. No, no. This is, so, I, so I was out in Russia for like six months and for, for all sorts of reasons, I, we had to come back early. Um, we were planning to be there for, for several years, but we didn't. And then I came to work for the UK government. Well, I mean, you can imagine how the UK, because I was working in a high security environment. I had to be cleared, security cleared and stuff. Oh you my can imagine God. How, how fun that was when, when I just come back from Russia. You're like James Bond. You have all this like security level of clearances. Yeah. Well, they, they, they weren't happy about my, my having been in Russia for quite a while. And, and everything, <laughs> oh my but God. I got the clearance eventually. <laughs> I know this is a like a slight tangent, but I always thought that if you got a security level clearance, like, oh my God, you're a special one. There's like a special terminal. You can log in with a security clearance and then you can access like some, I don't know, like top secret stuff. I mean, is that just like movie stuff, bond stuff? No, I mean, I think there's, there's a degree of truth in that. It depends on your level of clearance. Um, but it's it's more that you have to be cleared in order to be allowed, allowed to access certain records and have certain, you know because the the if you like the access that I had to information about customers was quite high, and so I needed to be cleared for that. Um, but as I say, because I've been in Russia, they were very interested in knowing a lot about me in order before they were prepared to give me clearance. So they had they asked okay. very very personal questions. They had to go into <laughs> kind of very deep level of 
um, information sharing before they were allowed to, before they were prepared to. So I, I stopped you as you were saying that you were doing a lot of fraud monitoring and detection um, for the UK government. Yes, exactly. So so we were doing we were so I I basically um, was part of the team designing the transaction monitoring system for all all of the money that flowed through the revenue the tax revenue service HMRC and. Wow. Um, and so I think I think that's about uh, I think that to give you an idea, it's roughly about kind of five hundred to six hundred billion pounds. So it's like like a year. That's kind of how much money flows through the tax service, and that's that's kind of what we're talking about. So it's a you know I don't know how much that is in dollars, but probably seven eight hundred million uh, seven eight hundred billion dollars roughly that flows through it, just in terms of reporting and and money going in, in and coming out and stuff. Um, and so you can imagine there's a lot of fraud and there's a lot of error, but we were focused specifically on the fraud. And in order to do that job, because we were we were like this kind of all seeing eye over the whole tax system, I had to understand and had learned about m- almost all of the tax system. Like I had to go quite deeply into kind of companies tax and personal tax and really understand all the benefit system and stuff. Course, let me I mean, let I, me I, let me stop you right there. You said that you had to almost be an expert on taxation in the UK, like you had to learn about the tax code for companies, individuals. Why do you yeah. have to do that? What if you just like, I mean, you're a designer. I mean, I, a lot of times designers don't have to learn all the technical stuff, but why did you have well, to learn and want to learn yeah, about I mean, that? It's, it's a good yeah, it's a good point. So I didn't have to. It was really that I by osmosis, because I was going out and meeting the experts to understand their job, to understand how best to build the system to serve their needs. I ended up sitting next to them whilst they, and I said, okay, well, like, show me how you, how you make a determination that something's fraud or not fraud. And so they would talk me through the whole process. Well, this is how the tax works. And this is the sort of thing we see. And you know, this is something called carousel fraud, which is you know, where VAT companies pass on the, the VAT allowance and stuff. And then someone goes walk about with the money and stuff. And they, they teach you really how to spot stuff. And over time, I just picked it up. Um, and for, for the kind of, the majority of the time I was there, I really, really believed that we would be able to plug all the holes where all of this kind of money was being stolen or they were being, you know, it was all disappearing and flowing out of the, out of the tax system. We'd be able to plug all of these holes and then the money would be used for, for what it's supposed to be used for, for helping people and for health and social care and stuff. And that was my kind of purpose. That was my driving purpose behind being there. But after three years of being there, I realized that the organization itself is so massive and the tax service and the taxation system is so complicated that you're never going to, you're never going to escape and you're never actually going to, it's just a kind of, you're going to be on this treadmill forever. And the criminals are also smart. The people who want to avoid those, uh, like who want to make fraud, they're also very smart too. <laughs> it is cat and mouse. Absolutely. And so it's, it's constantly changing. Um, I mean, I dread to think how much fraud was, in the you know the um checks the, the checks that they sent out in the states that was probably f- rife with fraud i suspect that the checks like like some of the benefit stuff that they gave in the uk was rife with fraud as well i dread to think um yeah and so i kind of thought well actually uh, okay, the more i the more i understood about the tax system and the way that the that money works and the way that government is funded the kind of the more disillusioned i became really i was like this is just it's just a complicated mess. And what, as, as those thoughts were forming, we were, all, we were in the 2017 kind of bull run and I'd been kind of dabbling with crypto a little bit and getting really excited and really curious about all this stuff and took part in a few ICOs and got wrecked and, you know, all, all of the kind of craziness that was going on back then. And what does wrecked mean right, right away? Uh, wrecked got means wrecked, you lost, lost money? Lost all my money. <laughs> lost okay. all my money. Um, and so, so come the end of 2017, I'd sort of fulfilled the things that I felt that I wanted to do at HMRC at, in the UK government. And um, a friend who was also on my team introduced me to Itamar, who had been looking for a designer. And so we started talking, got on really well. And that's how I kind of fell in. I, I, I kind of, some of the things that I had been experiencing when I'd been going through all these ICOs and realizing like having to sign a transaction and set the gas limit on Ethereum and all this insane stuff. I was like, this has got to change. Like, people are saying crypto is the future. This is not the future. This is just, this is just pure insanity. 
So when I met Itamar and Itamar pitched me what he was wanting to achieve with Argent, getting rid of seed phrases, you know, not having to worry about gas, um, and making it feel like a kind of a neo bank, but with crypto, it's fully decentralized, non custodial neo bank. I was I was like, okay, this is what I've been looking for. This is this is solving all the pain points that I've had when I've been doing these ICOs and trying to buy crypto and trying to explore Ethereum. So so you know, where do I sign, basically? Um, and at the same time, so that was one side of it, and the other side of it was actually the the purpose I'd realized was I like we're not going to solve this from the inside of government. There are too many vested interests. There's there's too many um, too many fiefdoms really inside government where everyone has their own little bit and they're not interested in in solving problems really. They're interested in in saving for their retirement and keeping keeping the control of their little domain. And so I thought, well, let's give it a shot changing it from the outside. And let's let's build a completely parallel system called crypto, which is going to be really hard to censor. Actually, I, I've written some stuff on tax um, on my Medium blog around how hard it will be to tax this stuff eventually as well and, and the impact that will have on government. And I think it will force change. And so I was like, okay, I, can't, I haven't been successful in changing from the inside, so I'm going to try and force change from the outside. And that's kind of what led me full, full circle into crypto, it's, as well as my own personal experience with crypto and wanting to solve some of the obvious pain points like seed phrases and stuff. So that's how I found my way into it. Now, when you're talking to Itamar, who is the, one of the founders and CEO of Argent, how relevant was your understanding of crypto? Or at that stage, if, even if you didn't know anything about crypto, he would have still hired you. Do you think that played a big role in, in, in just like him hiring you, the fact that you had an understanding of crypto? I think... I'd have to ask him, but yeah, I mean, when in in the first little coffee that we had together, when I when I pulled out my ledger and I said I've got one of these, I think you know back then that was pretty unusual. It's unusual enough yeah. to find someone that had one, but to find a designer that True. that actually was had been using Absolutely. crypto and had a ledger, I think that was pretty surprising for him. Um, and I'm sure that it helped that I'd had some kind of understanding, but also the the work I've been doing monitoring transactions right crypto is all about transactions so yep. it was it was i just done three years of very relevant work albeit in the tax service but but it's all kind of very related in terms of the, the sorts of things that i was looking at the data um the way that transactions were flowing and stuff and it was the same sort of thing in crypto so so yeah i think it was i, I guess if someone had come from banking maybe a, a designer that had worked in some kind of banking app that may have been just as good yeah i'm sure that have, finding finding a designer that was into crypto was probably quite unusual and he was probably quite pleased but you'd have to ask him i don't know <laughs> <laughs> um so now that you are the head of design at arjun growing your team hired people looking to hire people in the future i'm going to ask you questions that a lot of designers want to ask and that i've heard in private conversations but it's like they don't want to like sound like stupid or greedy or whatever the right adjective is. And I don't give a damn. I'm just going to ask you. And I would love to hear what you think about these assumptions I have. And 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 what I mean by that is, for reference, this is 2022. So I'm talking in, in regards to a designer wanting to get into crypto in 2022. So obviously things have changed from when you got into, you know, uh, design world as a crypto designer versus now. So just, just for context. Yeah, I mean, it's been like almost four years since I started, which seems crazy now. I mean, I, I, <laughs> I, I don't, I, I've always thought for kind of OGs. I mean, the, the true OGs are like 2012 or whatever, 2011, maybe even earlier. But uh, you know, some of the with this new bull run, apparently I'm considered OG now. It's like, how does that work? You are. That make sense. <laughs> <laughs> so yeah. So in 2022, Graham. I want to join crypto, but I don't have any crypto experience. Maybe I have some big Fortune 500 company names on my resume. I don't know, the Googles of the world, the Ubers of the world. Do you think that's enough? Or how important do you think today understanding of the blockchain, cryptocurrency is important if I want to get a job as a crypto designer? I don't think it's necessary to understand the blockchain and crypto. Um, because I think that, well, there are... 
aspects of it which are issues for designers just because they haven't really been solved by the engineers yet. Um, it's, it's hard to kind of uh, I could go into a few examples, but ultimately, if the way I see it is that if we want crypto to succeed, if we want non-custodial, censorship-resistant money to succeed, it has to be 10 times better than what we have today that's centralized and custodial, i.e. the banks hold your money for you. They can stop you taking it out. Um, and so if we are limiting ourselves to what blockchain does today and, and all of the quirks and limitations and irritations of blockchain today, then we're never going to get 10x and we're never going to actually achieve that promise. So for that reason, I don't think it really matters if as a designer, you don't understand this stuff, the blockchain specifically, because you shouldn't really have to. And I, I in some ways, I think maybe designers that don't understand are at an advantage because they'll be asking questions. They'll be asking the question, why? Why, do, why does it? Oh, you know, when an engineer wow. says, we can't do that, a designer should, should say, well, why can't we do that? They shouldn't just lie down and accept. And maybe if they know too much about the blockchain, maybe they'd be more willing to accept that it's an issue, but actually it shouldn't be, and it should be solved. And so designers need to kind of trust their instinct, I think, and push back hard. And fortunately, this is why I love Argent, is that the, right from the top, the founders themselves are, the, are of the same attitude and don't just accept that a certain way of doing things is the right way of doing things. And, and so we're all kind of singing from the same hymn sheet, beating the same drum. But yeah, I don't think designers should worry about that. That's an amazing take that I that I have you know heard because my assumption was that in such a hot market where you know um the demand i see for crypto designers is high from what i'm seeing and to me it seems like if one has domain expertise it might give them an edge but i also see your point about you know if they don't have domain expertise they're going to ask you know um beginner level questions and challenge the assumption but if I'm going to be a designer in crypto and I'm designing for those users, is it not like a lot of work for me to just get onboarded up to speed? Like what's going on? And like the industry is moving so fast. Like how do you deal with that? Like every day there's some new development. There are some, there are some concepts which I think for a new designer are a bit strange. So if you take the, the idea of tokens, like I remember thinking with, you know, years ago, what's it? What's the token? Why are they talking about tokens? What's an ERC twenty token? Um, and not really understanding what that was. Now, really, in most cases, a token is just a share of something. There are different things. They're like a token that represents a a dollar equivalent or a pound equivalent. They're called stable coins, um, and they have different types. There are different flavors of that. Like there's USDC, which is backed backed by dollars backed well in, in most cases it's backed by dollars but then you have DAI which is a an algorithmic stable coin which is backed by crypto itself um and by backed it means that it the the value of say let's say you have ethereum that's um the, the value of the ethereum that is then kind of locked up and, and deposited based on that you're then allowed to draw out a um, an amount of this stable coin it's a bit like having a mortgage of a house um and it, and when you mortgage your house you can then release some money from that house in the form of cash and do what you want with it and so so you have this this equity that's locked up this kind of collateral which is your house but in the case of die it's ethereum or or some other coins as well um but so there are different flavors of these of these stable coins but basically they're all just tokens and then ma the majority of tokens are some kind of share even if they're called a governance token it kind of it's it's a it's a share but with no dividend off it, um, and so it is possible to if if you come from if you have any kind of experience in any kind of shares or stocks or shares then it's very easy I think to translate that over. If you had no experience in any kind of trading or any kind of banking or any kind of um, foreign exchange, like even if even just swapping money between yeah. currencies and stuff, like all of that helps I think. But if you've not done it can any very of that, challenging. Yeah, you might find it a bit more challenging just because it's it is very financial, and that's that's the only kind of caveat, I suppose, to to what I've what I said before. Because the reason I'm asking you this question is because 
I think that Argent is hands down one of the best designed wallet experiences out there. Um, even for people who are just getting started out there, so kudos to you and the team. And, you know, I, I see your activity on Twitter. I've, I've had conversations with you before this. And it is very clear to me that you are continuously updating your knowledge with the latest developments in crypto. What are things happening? And, and because you're doing that, the experience at Argent is keeping up to date with that. I can see that in the experience. So you're thinking ahead, you're up to date. And, and this is very different from, let's say, if you're working or designing some tools for some 100-year-old company, like a regulated industry. Things are not changing overnight. You go in, you do your job, and you're out. Like, that's it. Yes, I think that's probably fair. But this yeah. is different, right? Would you say that? This is a little bit different from that? You can't just come in and do your thing and not expect to update any of your knowledge, especially if you're working in crypto? No, I could, like, like, yeah. you. I think it's if you have a team around you that is like a product team, that someone has to understand it at the end of the day. So, you know, if you have a product manager, they're going to be the ones that understand it and you end up just getting told what to do. If as, a, if as a designer, you're satisfied with that and not fully understanding the reasons behind something um, and the reasons why you're being told by your product manager, just do this, then okay. But I would argue that if you want to design something successfully and you really want to solve problems, you kind of need to understand what the problem is fully. So yes, there is, I think if you want to get into this space, and you want to be effective and successful, then yeah, you need to be prepared to to read a lot and and really immerse yourself. And not just read, I think try all the protocols, you know, do some swaps on Uniswap, um, send some money between a, a Ethereum and an exchange and do some investments and you know, you're gonna lose money probably. Um, you might also gain some money. You may get an airdrop, which may you know, may cancel yeah. out all of your losses. And, um, but you will learn a lot. And as you start to do that, you'll start to kind of appreciate how, how things work and why they work. But um, there are kind of, there's, there's a deeper level as well of understanding, I think, that I aspire to. And that's kind of getting into like the protocol level and to understand why things like CK rollups, zero knowledge rollups are, are a, better solution to a competitor L1 chain to Ethereum. I'm sure that some of the listeners probably don't even know what I'm talking about. Um, but it matters, but, but it matters though. It really matters. If, if you're, if you're wanting to, if your objective is to achieve decentralization and censorship, censorship resistance, then you need to understand how that, how certain technologies or certain um, approaches to you know, wh which technologies you are you going to invest in as a team? Now, the designer doesn't have to understand that, arguably, but they need to understand the implications of working with one particular decision versus another as a team, because there are implications. And and right there, when you mentioned about that, you know, like understanding the zk sync rollups, I think that's what, in my opinion, makes you so good at what you do design wise that i think that is what makes this behavior or mindset that you have i personally think it's one of the most essential things a designer has to have if they want to succeed in crypto is i'm going to bet that like just like normally if you have 9 to 5 working hours i would bet that there are times after work like the traditional after 9 to 5 you might be reading some protocol. You might be trying some new protocol. You might be trying a competitor wallet, whatever that is. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And I have a family as well. And then, and you know, my wife isn't very happy often about me doing this. And I, <laughs> I do try to. But I mean, that, there is that as well. It's like it's so full on, and it is twenty four seven. It's not like the stock market which closes at, you know, four pm or whatever. It's twenty four seven, seven days a week, and it's quite hard to shut off. So th you know, that is also something to to bear in mind. I think if you're going to get into this space. And, and, and I'm so glad you're opening that up because, you know, I work in companies like Fortune 500 companies in regulated industries where, you know, like the clients are just, an, again, big behemoth companies like Boeing or Apple and their are managers there. So a lot of times as a designer, you would wait for 
the product team or someone to involve you in a conversation, right? Because you're like, oh, how am I going to fight all these battles, all these fiefdoms? And who cares? Like at the end of the day, I mean, designers may not accept, but this is, this, is, this is the hard truth. A lot of times I would be sitting in the teams and the conversation would be like, oh, who cares? Like at the end of the day, it's just some like six-figure paid manager who's going to use these tools. So, I mean, if we fight this fight or not for them, like right now, who cares? Like it's, it's okay. It can wait the next day. But now in crypto, you're dealing with people's money. Like this is hardcore yes. money that if because of some stupid mistake or not good design, people can lose a lot of money. And I've, I've heard stories of people losing a lot of money because of just poor design. So yes. yeah, yeah. would it be fair to say that when you're working at Arjun and just taking this example, as a designer, you're not waiting to, for someone to say like, knock, knock, hey, Graham. We're having this conversation over here. Do you want to get involved uh, in this new design, or would you proactively get involved in conversations? I think I think that's another that's a good point as well. But I, again, I, I apply this to I apply this approach to any design. Like I don't really think it's specific to crypto. I have worked with designers that wait to be told what to do, and. But I've also worked with engineers that wait to be told, told what to do, you know, to, to developers and stuff. Um, and I find that the most effective people, the best designers and the best engineers are those that stick their oar in, curious, want to know. And yeah, we can be irritating sometimes when we do that. Um, on the one hand, it's kind of it's irritating because if we're always asking questions, it's like, oh, you know, do I have to tell this person? You go through the kind of the the process of explaining everything to them and stuff but on the other hand i'd far rather that someone wanted to know then ends up kind of saying okay what, what are we doing why are we doing that you know months later or don't really understand what it's about and stuff and um, i'd rather rather ask questions so yeah i think you do need to involve yourself and, and designers especially in design has been undervalued in crypto from the start i think it's a very engineering heavy space and NFTs aside, where you've got kind of artists and designers and stuff getting involved, where maybe that's starting to shift a bit, but it's more, it's more on the art side to an extent. And I think if you want to, if you have a strong feeling about something or a concern about something, you have to stick your oar in. You have to speak up. You can't just allow people to. I mean, there's something I tweeted just yesterday, in fact. I've tweeted something about um, a debate that we're having inside Argent right now. Uh, around whether we should surface the 24-hour price change of the tokens in a portfolio. And I shared it on a few private groups as well with other designers. And my the reason I raised it was because I'm concerned that 24-hour price changes are bad for mental health. They make for bad trading decisions because actually your short-term, it encourages short-term thinking. And people who overtrade famously lose money. And so why do you need to see 24 hour? What if you just showed an all time return, which encourages longer term thinking? If you're, if you know over the all, all time, I mean, it could be, could be a much deeper drawdown, to be fair. If you're in a, if you, if you bought right at the top and you're a year into a bear market, but, but for the most part, long term, your investments go up. And so this is, this is my debate. And, you know, a few people, most people say, well, if you don't show, people want to see the 24 hour return. If you don't show, they'll just go to a different app because they want to see the yeah. 24 hour return. Every time I open the app, I'll just see the same thing. So that's not, that's not very sticky. Um, and I get that. But it's, but again, I, I feel like I, I had this question. I had a concern around mental health and the impact of, of the decisions that I as a designer and we as a team make. And, I could have just kept that. I could have just swallowed it and just not said anything because it's like, well, everyone else yeah. did 24 hour returns. So we're just going to do the same thing. But I didn't, I raised it and we debated it. Um, and we probably will end up going with 24 hour returns just because that is genuinely what our customers want rightly or wrongly, but it's still playing in my head. And I'm thinking, okay, how can I, how can I find a way to encourage people to think more long-term inside Argent? And and I'm and I'll be probably mulling that for months potentially until I I find a way to kind of to work that in. Um, so I think as a designer you have a responsibility to to listen to your the, your kind of internal voice and ask questions and get involved. If you don't understand something, ask. 
yeah so i mean it's a long long-winded reply to that question but and this dilemma that you raised was it hard to recruit users for that like let's say you're like why well, I, I really think that this 24 hour return is having a negative impact on the health and you wanted to test that with potential users of Arjun. Is it hard to recruit users? Like, because I think about traditional user testing and user research, you know, you go to, uh, there's lots of websites where you can like put your prototype up, get people to give you feedback, give them Starbucks gift card. But in specific terms to crypto, is it easy? Is it hard for you to get users to give feedback? Um, so to, that, to, to the specific point around the 24 hour return and whether that's the best uh, approach, but I mean that that was really just a thought I had, but just because we're yeah. starting to talk about what you know where, where we start to surface your profit and loss inside the app, and um, which is a feature we're working on at the moment, and so we haven't even done we've barely even done any gotcha. prototypes for that yet. So I won't I, I haven't even kind of got around to usability testing it, but it was more about the principle: is it the right thing to do? Um, and in this in that particular case, I think to get a proper answer, you'd have to do a long term study really because yeah you know you don't you'd have to go through a kind of a cycle of a bear market or you know see see if we do this then then we measure kind of up up is, is the majority of people's trades causing them to lose money and is that linked to them opening the app seeing a, a down day and selling at the bottom and yeah, I mean, I'm curious about, I think you'd need to do that on mass with larger data. It'd probably be more of a data-driven exercise than a usability test because you wouldn't really be able to truly understand someone's behavior just by observing them opening the app once. True. On, you know, at a random point in time. In, ter in terms of general research and recruitment, what's cool about uh, crypto is that there are a lot of interest groups. There's a lot of Telegram groups and Discords and there's Reddit and t crypto Twitter famously, infamously. <laughs> and a lot of people that are really willing to try stuff out, not least because they that there there's this whole airdrop phenomenon. And if you try out, if you're an early adopter, in many cases you get airdrops. So there's an incentive there. And that doesn't mean that um, you always get airdrops, but there's always this possibility. And so people are very willing to to try out. So you can just, I mean, I just often just post in Telegram groups, and there is there are kind of there's a crypto testers Telegram group. It's 700 people in it, and um, and they're all often very willing to try stuff out. That's that's kind of why the group exists, and there's oh, wow. there's like a, a, a resource right there. You just post a message, say who's up for this, and you usually get a dozen responses. And I love that. I love the fact that you are actively spending time in these Discord channel, Telegram groups, understanding what the users want, bringing those insights back to Argent. I might butcher this code. Um, but just to paraphrase in one of our previous conversations, um, and pardon me if I got this wrong, you said something along the lines of, if you don't really understand what the user's problems are and you just create a product or just create something, then you're, you're more of like an artist. Like it's just art. It's just your interpretation of what it should be. But to really be a product designer, not an artist, like to to really like differentiate between just just pure graphic design or just pure artwork versus product design work, you really have to understand the user problems and solve for that. Yeah, that's exactly exactly right. Yeah, that was so mind blowing to me. Yeah, I mean, we we call ourselves designers. Design. How does how is design different from art? Well, it's because we're solving a problem. If we're not solving a problem, then it's not design. And so, and so then we need to go back to, okay, if, we're, if there's a problem to solve, we have to understand the problem well enough to be able to solve it. And that's, that's just how, that's kind of how I see things. So yes, it means then I, I tend to kind of go to the nth degree of understanding a problem. Um, and maybe I sometimes go a bit deeper than I have to, but it's, you know, I, I like to spend a lot of time with users. I like to spend a lot of time in Discord channels or, or usability testing, um, but also reading about the technology, the reasons why maybe the engineers say, well, well it's going to be really difficult to do what you've asked us to do. So I kind of want to fully appreciate their position as kind of not, not, as, not as users per se, but they're also people, right? And that, you know, I'm asking them to do something and, 
and giving them hassle for, for us not being able to to do what I'd like to do. So I, I feel it's really important to understand as many perspectives as possible um, from from my own team through to the end users and and to kind of fully appreciate what I'm what problems I'm trying to solve and how best to solve them. And sometimes like I'll come up with an idea with the engineering team and say, okay, well what if we try this? And they'll be like, actually yeah we could do, we did it like that. You know, and, and none of the engineering team themselves have actually come up with that idea themselves. And so by digging as a designer, really digging into and understanding the problem, like just occasionally you can you you know you may come up with a a solution that even the engineering team haven't thought of. It doesn't happen often. But I mean, at a kind of a, at a technology level, as opposed to just at a UI level. So, love it. Here's another assumption that I have that it was money, and I know it's touchy, but it's not just me. I'm probably sure there's a lot of designers out there who think that I want to join or I want to break into the crypto design world because there's a lot of money to be made. According to your perspective, how much of that is true or maybe just over-exaggerated? Um, what is your take on that? Yeah, it's a difficult one, really. There's a, there's a lot of money to be lost as well in crypto. As, as a, <laughs> as you, if you're watching crypto Twitter right now, there are a lot of very sad, sad-looking faces and, and negative-sounding tweets around. Um, I mean, I joined, I think I talked about this earlier, I joined Argent because I really wanted to solve the UX problems that I'd experienced going through ICOs and stuff in 2017, getting rid of seed phrases and all of that. I just thought it was all crazy. And I also had this sort of ideology of having a go at changing kind of government and money from the outside. So I was a bit ideological and a bit kind of, that was my purpose really. And it remains really, that that remains my purpose. And it was April, 2018 that I joined Argent. And that was in, that was full bear market. Um, we'd come off the highs like just a, a few weeks before basically. And we were really oh crashing God. hard. So I, my portfolio was well and truly in the red. Um, and I wasn't really joining for the money. But that said, there have been, but by being involved so closely with the cutting edge of crypto, there have been many, many opportunities, many of which I've missed entirely to my absolute chagrin, you know, like, like people and like crypto punks in, you know, I've, and like board apes, all, all of that. <laughs> I was like, I, I was, was a board of one too. I was espousing NFTs and saying NFTs. And basically because OpenSea didn't work with Arjun, I was kind of like, I don't really want to open MetaMask. It's not safe. I don't want to put crypto in MetaMask. So if it's not if it's not working with Argent, then I'm not going to do it. And so I just, I passed on CryptoPunks. I passed on Board Apes. Um, I passed on uh, getting involved in kind of some of the Beeples and getting kind of onto Nifty Gateway. I was really I was a bit too ideological and really anti centralized services like Nifty Gateway and Makerspace and stuff. Um, and because of that, I am not a millionaire. Now, in fact, I'm not a multi-millionaire, even though I was well aware of them at the time. I really liked them. Actually, I was really interested in them, but it was literally just my own, um, I don't know if you call it arrogance or stupidity or just sort of laziness, maybe a bit of all of that. So, so yes, so oh, I suppose that's kind of saying that there is potential money to be made in crypto. It doesn't mean you will, because it depends on all sorts of other factors. But you, if you're in the space 24-7, yes, you will be exposed to opportunities left, right, and center, some of which are full-on Ponzi scams, and if you put your money in, you'll lose it all, and some of which can 100x or 1,000x, or in some cases, 100,000x. So, um, yeah, it's, it's pretty wild in that sense. But overall, I've done quite well. Like, I've, you know, I've, I've, I, I'm, I'm kind of quite happy with my position. Um, but I'm not like, I'm nothing like as successful as just want somebody bought one crypto punk, for example, like, <laughs> you know, and I have friends that are in their, in their early twenties that just, you know, they just bought a couple of crypto punks and a people early on and they just, re they retired. <laughs> it's, just like, oh my God. You know, it's like, how is that possible? You know, when I'm, when I'm full time in this space, how do they do that? And I didn't. But, yeah. It's so amazing. You bring that up when you said there's a lot of money to be lost and I've lost a decent amount of change in crypto. Yeah, so have I. Um, yeah. 
Yeah. And I think people don't understand this is that while there's lots of opportunities to make money, there's lots of opportunities to lose money. And I do feel that being at the cutting edge of crypto exposes you to a lot of opportunities and potentially missing out on it as well. And one thing I just wanted to bring up, this is a side tangent, but I think it's so relevant because people listening to this might fear FOMO that, oh, Graham got into this in 2018 and stuff, but yes, he also missed an opportunity. And likewise, when you said that, I so I was collaborating with one of the um, uh, folks. So um, Abhinav, uh, he came on the show, a good friend, and he wanted to do like he's a very famous YouTuber in India um, uh, in the design realm, and he wanted to do um, this like a, a daily show, um, just like a weekly YouTube stream, like daily YouTube stream on just NFTs and stuff. And uh, he pitched me the idea, and I was like, I don't know, man, like I'm. I really wasn't into the NFT space at that point. I wasn't into the decentralized finance space, but I wasn't in the NFT space. So I kind of yeah. like, well, now I already had this podcast going on. So it was just like, I don't know. It just wasn't a convincing enough reason to kind of like do it just for 30 days and see how it goes. Because I was like, we should like have a long-term goal. Anyways, so I didn't do it and he did it solo. And as part of that show to explain to people how to buy NFTs, guess what he bought? He bought two board apes. <laughs> Very nice. Yeah. Um, and which is well, really awesome for him. And it's insane. It's life changing. It, it is. Yeah. It is. And for me, I look at that decision and, you know, um, I had that moment where I was like, well, I missed out on that, even though I, I had that someone tell me about it. Right. Mm -hmm. But very recently I was talking to a, a successful entrepreneur in Chicago. I was having dinner with him and, you know, I was talking to him. He's like, that's all if, but could, should. He's like, yes, you're assuming that if you had bought it, you would have held on to it. What if you had just sold it when it just also, like you bought yeah, it at exactly. 200 and yeah. sold it at 1,000? Yeah. Who should know? What if the project didn't go as successful? So yeah, yeah, yeah. it's very easy when you have a winning something succeed. You just go back and just assume that you took all the right steps. So I know we went off on a tangent, but... Yeah, no, that's true. There's so many, even, even if you did, as you say, there are so many steps to, um, to that. I mean, like with NFTs, it took me a while to realize that the, the the safest i think one of the safest ways to get into nfts is is if you can get whitelisted you have you kind of you want to be on that on that early early kind of pre-sale list and and then you want to buy at least kind of three if you can and if you can you know obviously you want to do your research on projects but you've got to flip the first one flip one of those three as soon as you can to to make sure you you pay back the cost of of the purchase plus the gas and then you can just hold and then in the and then if you get a short term kind of bull run, as often that happens, there are lots of people that weren't in the pre sale that want to buy and they'll buy higher. And so you can then wait until it kind of peaks out and then sell the second one. And then you have one to just hold for the for the long term. Um and that is something I've I've not done, but I I sort of recently realized that actually that's definitely the best way to to do this. I have other other friends that just go full degenerate into it and just buy loads and flip them and sell them and stuff. <laughs> I think I think for the most part, you know, they've made quite a lot of money doing that, but it's just too scary for me. And my my original kind of the, the big part I didn't get into board apes was at the time not only because of it not working with Argent and me needing to set up MetaMask and not wanting to, but it was also at the time I was really determined to stack ETH. I really wanted to get as much ETH as I possibly could, and the thought of spending even kind of half an ETH or an ETH on a board ape at the time was just, I was just like, ah, oh, you know, but this is, this is precious <laughs> to me. I've been, been, had this goal for ages and I'm going to be undermining my own goal if I do this. Obviously, you know, in hindsight, hindsight's a wonderful thing. But as you say, it could have, would have, should have, you know, that's not the way to think about it. I think the way to think about it is if you have, it, it's, it, it's really, it's Jeff Bezos' regret minimization framework. If you have, uh, an opportunity in front of you and you ask yourself the question, would I regret trying this and losing all of that money or not trying at all? Like, would I regret actually not just giving it a go? Which one would I regret more? Then choose, choose, choose the one you'd regret less. Just minimize your regrets. And if at the time, you know, I look back and I think, well, if, if it had gone to zero, I would have been upset with myself. So I, absolutely, I, and I, yeah, and I made and I made the decision at the time. You know what? I'm not going to dive into this. And I've done the same thing recently with Doodles, and I'll, I'll probably regret it. You know, at the time when Doodles were about four and a half ETH, I didn't have 
the money, didn't have the ETH. Um, and then like I, I managed to do a couple of things. I managed to get get that much ETH together, but by that point it was Tenny. And I was like, I'm not gonna I'm not gonna shell out Tenny from it. And it could it could be the next board apes. But you know, but the risk reward goes works against me the higher that price goes. You know, so absolutely. Yeah, so it's a, it's a difficult one. I think you just every single opportunity you have to take it as it comes. I mean, I have a short story about Shiba. I could have been a probably a billionaire with Shiba if I just put in like a thousand dollars or something because I, oh I was God. aware of it way before. I mean, this is so this these are the sorts of things as a designer of the opportunities that come along. So we have a form on the Argent website which allows teams to, that have released a token to put in their token information. Um, and then I take that information and I, I'll add it to the token service, which puts the icon and the branding and the information about the token inside the Argent app. And Shiba were one of the teams that uploaded this stuff way before anyone knew about them, like right at the start. It was, I don't know what the price of the token was. It was nothing. And um, I, look, and I look through and I check all these tokens and I, I have a kind of a curio, cur, curatorial approach to it. I'm like, if it's really, really bad, I'm probably not going to bother or, or I don't actually want to expose our user base to to that token, so I won't won't encourage it. And I looked at Shiba, and quite frankly, I was like, "What is this? This is just really dodgy. I'm not going to touch it with a barge pole." <laughs> um, and you know, if, if I'd had the habit of maybe just putting in a hundred dollars to every single token that gets added to that list, <laughs> I would have been, been oh extraordinarily wealthy. You know, just, it, it, it's not just it's not just Shiba. Actually, there's another one, Deep Dopex, as well. Um, they they filled in the form. Uh, I don't know when it was back in March, I think, 2021, and I didn't. I ignored it, and and Dopex is now, I don't know how many. It's like a three thousand dollars per coin. And back then it was like ten or something. So again, oh I've, my like God. I have, I've missed out on opportunity after opportunity after opportunity. Um, so again, to go back to that question, yes, there are a lot of opportunities, or there have been a lot of opportunities to get very very rich. It doesn't mean you're going to get very very rich. It just means that the but you're happy right now as I'm talking to you because your sole reason to get into the space was not just purely making money. Because I can see it if if someone having missed this many life changing opportunities, right? And and you have access front row access to them. You and, and you you said you missed some of them. I've missed so many. <laughs> it's ridiculous, and I'm not and I'm not even sure why. Like it's just you know it's just that's just how it's happened. But yeah. that was not your main reason. So if someone got into the crypto space purely 100% just for money. Yes. Then I can see that that person would be very very sad right now. So I'm just getting that realization I'm talking yeah, to. Yeah, I mean or they could have been very 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 happy. I mean they may have been fully fully successful, I suppose, but yeah, as you say it's not been my driving for that's not been my driver at all. And um and any money I have made or will make it's kind of yeah, it's great, and yeah, don't get me wrong. It would be nice to not ha to, to have yeah. have you know a few money basically, and to not have to worry about yeah. anything ever again. But that that ultimately that's not why I'm here, you know. And I yeah, I'm I'm ha and I'm I'm happy with my decisions. Um, and I I'm also curious if at some point another one will come along and I will make the you know the right, or well, I'll, I'll I'll spot <laughs> it and do it and and it will work. It, it, but it's more about curiosity. It's not. It's not a determination to kind of exhaustively look at every single opportunity and think I'm not going to miss the next one. You know that just is crazy. That's just a, a, a great way to blow your mental health out of the water. So um, it's better just to accept it and and just enjoy the, enjoy the ride. Really, love it. So how can designers who are in crypto and want to be successful like you, what are the right mindset, or designers looking to break into crypto? How can they find you? How can they uh, get in touch with you? Um, you can find me on Twitter. I'm, I spend too much time on Twitter. Itamar hasn't said anything yet, but maybe he'll watch this and say, <laughs> yeah. I've noticed actually you're spending too much time on Twitter. Get back to work. Um, <laughs> but yeah, tw Twitter mainly is probably the best place. Yeah. Uh, my gotcha. Twitter is Graham Blackwood. So it's just, yeah, I'd probably, probably share it, I guess. Yeah, I'll be including that in the show notes. Just want to say thank you so much, Graham, for coming on the show and sharing your wisdom. Thank you so much for having me. Um, I hope it's been helpful to the to your listeners. And um, yeah, do anyone, if they ever want to get in touch or ask a question or um, 
yeah or share anything please just ping me i'm always open always love chatting absolutely